case. You can save thousands on 2018 Hondas and we'll double your factory warranty to 10 years. Plus, save time. Buy online at RickCaseHonda.com. Open every night till midnight through Monday only at Rick Case Honda. Get your day started right with CBS4 This Morning. Weekdays starting at 4.30. Now, from CBS4 News, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. I humbly accept the Democratic nomination. And we'll keep Florida great and we'll make it even greater. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Jim DeFeedy and welcome to Facing South Florida. Well, I have to say, for a midterm primary election, that was pretty darn exciting. Daphne Campbell lost her bid to stay in the state Senate. Lori Aladef, whose daughter was killed during the Stoneman Douglas massacre, was elected to the Broward School Board. And the ethically challenged Michael Greco is the newest state representative for Miami Beach. But the story of the night was easily the surprise victory of Andrew Gillum, who defeated Gwen Graham, Philip Levine, and Jeff Green. Later in the show, I'm going to talk about all of this with Senator Marco Rubio. We're also going to discuss with Rubio how the president's proposed trade deal with Mexico will hurt Florida growers. But the big story remains Andrew Gillum. And joining me to break it down is Patricia Mazze, Miami Bureau Chief for the New York Times. Patty, thank you for coming in. Hi. Hi. What a week. What a week, what a week indeed. So I, I just want to sort of delve into the whole Andrew Gillum surprise uh, victory. You know, you were in Gwen Graham's surprise party, or playing the odds along the, with like 20 news crews in the national press. Talk to me a little bit about what that room was like as as the returns were coming in. You know, I think the first sign that something was happening was when Orange County came in in Orlando, and uh, Gillum looked like he was maybe going to win it. Um, and then Dade County came in and Philip Levine was in the lead, which people expected because he's the mayor of Miami Beach. But instead of it being Graham, who was in second place after early voting came in, it was Gillum. The, what, what's that, what was at stake in this race for the Democrats? How do you explain Gillum's victory? I think they had to decide if they were going to put up another moderate candidate in a midterm election and try to win in a year when usually it's a conservative electorate that comes out, right, as opposed to presidential years. And they rejected that because it hasn't worked, worked for them in the past four elections. There's a reason why Democrats have been out of the governor's mansion for 20 years, and some of them seem to think that it's maybe because they haven't voted with their hearts. They haven't voted for the most progressive candidate, and this year they did. You're exactly what I wrote down, heart versus head. Democrats for the last number of cycles in the governor's race have gone with their head, thinking strategically. Let's get somebody in the center who can pull off some Republican votes. This time they wanted passion. They wanted to fall in love. Last time they picked a former Republican. Turn independent, turn Democrat, and Charlie Chris. I mean, that's how moderate we were talking about. And that's Gillum's strength, is to excite people, to bring new voters to the polls. And I think when we start looking at the numbers after the election to see how the turnout changed, there were a lot of new voters coming in, and Gillum was able to tap into that, wasn't At he? one point, the Florida Democratic Party said that 25% of the people who voted early uh, were people who don't vote in midterm elections. So that was Gillum's theory of the case. And we were all sort of skeptical because until you see it, you don't know if it's going to happen. And then the early vote was where he started moving up right towards the end. And then he just crushed it on election day, especially in like majority African-American counties in Northern Florida and in sort of urban counties, right? Miami, Dade and Broward, which we mentioned, but also Duval or Jacksonville is. And I think it's wrong to just sort of immediately just go to, well, Bernie Sanders was able to turn around for him. You have to remember, Gillum was also a Hillary Clinton surrogate. He had spoken at the convention which for he's Hillary Clinton. Which happy to talk about right now because he doesn't want to be pegged just as some Bernie Sanders person. but. It is important to note that it was that Sanders visit when they had those rallies in Tampa and Orlando that sort of where you started seeing the upswing um, in, in people talking about Gillum and knowing who he was because his big challenge all along was maybe people just don't know I'm running because I'm not on television, I don't have enough money. Um, he told me after the election that at one point they invested in highway billboards, which as you and I know is not a typical political advertising device. But it was just so that people could see that there was a 39 year old black man running for governor. They didn't know. And, and it, you know, people don't like us to bring up ethnic politics, which I, I understand, but there was a reason why they were, they wanted that, his face there was just because there is an important chunk of the Democratic primary electorate that is African American. And then within 15 hours of Andrew Gillum winning, Ron DeSantis goes on Fox News and he says this. Let's, let's play the Ron DeSantis sound. 
the last thing we need to do is to monkey this up by trying to embrace a socialist agenda with huge tax increases and bankrupting the state. I, won't, I was speechless when I heard it. And it's one of those things where the Gillum campaign and the Democratic Party was, I think, brilliant politically in terms of jumping on that issue. Talk about, could you have started your campaign for governor if you're Ron DeSantis in a worse way than with that gaffe? You know, what was interesting about that moment is for whatever reason, I think the timing of it, the fact that it was when people were still paying attention to the fact that, that Gillum had managed to win, um, you know, Ron DeSantis goes on Fox News all the time. The, this particular interview just sort of exploded because people were paying attention and um, it pierced the public conscience in a way that people who are not political junkies knew about it, heard about it. The Onion did a, a headline spoofing it, right? <laughs> now, we should say that DeSantis's campaign has said that it's absurd to call this racist, that that was, you know, not what he meant. And the governor, Governor Rick Scott, when asked about this, um, basically said that DeSantis had been an artful, you know, that he didn't think he meant any harm. Um, but God, it, it certainly made it look like it was going to be an ugly campaign. And the question, too, Jim, I think, is if there is going to be sort of a backlash, not to to DeSantis, but actually to people's reaction to DeSantis, sort of like when we saw when President Trump was running, that you would think that something would sort of tank him, but instead it got people angry at like, oh, why are they policing, you know, speech, these elites in the media policing speech. And if it's going to be a campaign of division, I think we all sort of have to be aware well, that, that that is... Well, that is in the ether. Well, let's talk about that, what this campaign is going to look like heading over the next 10 weeks. Uh, everyone seems to suggest that it's going to be a race to the center. I don't see this as a race to the center. I think both candidates will try to pull voters, but I see this as your classic base election, where you not only want to go to your base, but you want to increase your base. Certainly on the Democratic side, Andrew Gillum wants to do what he did in the primary, which was bring in new voters, bring in, bring in people who hadn't voted before, and try to raise that number up. And I think Ron DeSantis will try to do the same thing. I don't think it's going to be as much center as, as everyone thinks. Yeah, they, they're, that's just not the way their messages have played out, and they just don't have that much time. Florida's primary is so late in the calendar that we're talking less than 70 days now no time before to pivot. the general. Right. No time to pivot, and early voting starts. I mean, Election Day is not in November. Election Day starts in October. Um, DeSantis probably spies an opening, um, and, and we have seen him calling Gillum a socialist, right, because of the Bernie Sanders Association. And that can play in a place like Dade County which is, you know, blue, but is full of, of people from Latin America, especially Cuban Americans who came from other countries and sort of reject that label. So is DeSantis going to be able to define Gillum in a way that'll win over, you know, some of the Hispanic voters that, that Gillum himself is trying to increase his base with? I, I don't know. I think it's going to be fascinating to see. Sure. And just to let folks know, I'm not uh, in the booth. I'm not going to play any more sound. We're just going to continue with the interview. But I heard a wise woman recently say 2020 is now. Who could that have been? It was you. And, and uh, talk about how this has national implications, this race. R Ron DeSantis versus Andrew Gillum. This is a proving ground that Democrats, progressive Democrats around the country are trying to show a progressive can win. You don't have to run a moderate, even in 2020, going looking ahead. I mean, if a progressive can win in a state like Florida, the, the biggest presidential battleground, um, we're going to see in 2018 what people thought we would see in 2020, which was how do you challenge Trump's agenda, mostly because DeSantis has so closely embraced the president that people really associate, you know, the president and DeSantis together. They go hand in hand. DeSantis had that, that ad with his kids, you know, reading him the art of the deal. Um, so this is going to be the place where we're going to see, well, how do progressives take on Trump and does it work? And I think you're going to see some interesting surrogates come in, you know, uh, and talking to yeah. the, 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 the Gillum campaign, they've already, you know, just the first calls that Andrew Gillum got, Kamala Harris, you know, Bernie Sanders, down, down the list, those who want, have presidential aspirations going into, no, going into 2020. And you're going to have a similar dynamic in Georgia, right, where we, we always focus on Florida politics, but you have Stacey Abrams running there, who would become the first female African-American governor. Ben Jealous in Maryland. You know, ben Jealous in Maryland. Um, and so you're you're going to start maybe seeing, you know, we thought this might be sort of a sleepy traditional Florida governor's race. A year ago, we would have said it probably looked like Adam Putnam against Glenn Graham, and now uh, it's an entirely different game. Both, ca both sides got exactly what they wanted. Democrats wanted to run against DeSantis. The, uh, uh, Demo Republicans wanted to run against Gillum. They got it. 
game on. It's going to be fun. People voted their hearts, and the candidates that raised the most money and spent the most money all lost. All right. Patty Mize, I'm sure we'll be covering it more. We'll have you back. Thank Up you. next, Senator Marco Rubio on John McCain, NAFTA, and Tuesday's election results. It's the beginning of the end. What? It's an incredible deal. It's an incredible deal for both parties. Most importantly, it's an incredible deal for the workers and for the citizens of both countries. Uh, our farmers are going to be so happy. That was President Donald Trump announcing last week he had renegotiated NAFTA with Mexico. The deal helps auto manufacturers and farmers in the Midwest. But the farmers in Florida, despite the president's pleas, may not be so happy. In fact, the deal the president cut will actually hurt Florida growers. On Wednesday, I spoke to Senator Marco Rubio about the death of John McCain, Tuesday's elections. But we begin with the president's new trade deal. Is it a good deal for Florida farmers or a bad deal for Florida farmers? Well, if they don't fix the vegetable growers issue, it's a bad deal for Florida's farmers. And are they in this? Do we well, know? It doesn't, I don't believe that part of this deal got fixed. Look, Mexico has done everything possible to wipe out our vegetable growers. People don't know this, but Florida vegetables are basically the only domestic vegetables grown in the winter. So a lot of the vegetables on table at Thanksgiving across America are grown in this state. Not, not, just sure. in the, not just in the EAA. You're talking about corn. You're talking yeah, about tomatoes, lettuce, tomatoes. Tomatoes, absolutely. Florida, winter vegetables. Mexico has done everything possible to destroy that industry. How, how so? Well, they undercut us. They flood us with cheaper alternatives. Because um, our seasons are the same. So, so we're on the same cycle in right. terms and of... And it happens with strawberries and blueberries, too. But particularly tomatoes, they dump. They basically dump uh, tomatoes into our marketplace, undercutting the price point for our farmers and wiping them out. And if you care about the environment, think about what happens to that land if it's no longer about vegetables. What do you do with land, for example, in South Dade when it no longer is growing vegetables? Well, the next option is you develop it. And that means people move in, houses are built, fertilizer goes into the ground uh, at heavy levels, much heavier than you could see in agriculture and the impact that has on our water and so forth. So we can't lose agriculture. Second, we want to have an agriculture industry in Florida. And, uh, and it's important for the country to be able to feed ourselves. And so if NAFTA and this deal does not treat our Florida farmers fairly, if it doesn't fix that injustice, uh, I'm going to have a big problem with this deal. Um, and, and frankly, I'm not sure they can do a deal unless Canada is included in it. This would become a bilateral deal. They don't have uh, expedited trade uh, power to just execute a deal with one country. 
in this deal that the president is striking with Mexico, it seems as if he was trying to do the best deal possible for auto manufacturing, that that, that was the main impetus, and that he was willing to concede things in other areas. Is that, did, do you sort of well, see I, that as the struggle that not, was going on here, that basically Florida farmers and growers were pitted against well, auto I mean, workers? No, I mean, part of the problem was some of the other agriculture interests also turned on us, you know, uh, the pork producers and corn. For them, for, uh, Mexico is an export market. And so as long as their interests were protected and automakers' interests were protected, it kind of left us out in the cold. And we knew it would be a challenge the whole time. And they may not need our vote in order to get this thing reauthorized. But I'm going to have a big problem with a deal if it doesn't take care of Florida's farmers and bring some justice and fairness to that process. And and frankly, I'll be deeply disappointed because it, uh, it, it, it will have left behind a key, the, a key group in a, an important state. What's the response that you've gotten when you've tried to raise these issues with the negotiating team? That Mexico paid a pretty hard line on it, and I'm sure they did. I mean, they've they got a pretty good deal, and um, and that you know, like I said, look, a Florida farmers' issues probably don't matter as much to Kansas, Mississippi, Missouri, Wyoming, all these other states in the country, but they matter in a very important state, and they matter to two senators in the U.S. Senate, and so we'll take that into account whenever the final deal is, is presented. But they, they know that this is going to be an impediment um, if if they don't get it fixed. And, and if they need our vote and they need our support, uh, I expect they'll address it somehow. Let's talk about the, the results from uh, Tuesday's election. Uh, we're setting up a pretty interesting governor's race where you've got somebody who is proud and unabashedly conservative as a Republican nominee in Ron DeSantis and somebody who is proud and unabashedly progressive and liberal on the Democratic side in Andrew Gillum. Uh, how, how do you judge this fight and what do you see uh, well, going I, forward? I, I think voters will have a pretty clear choice between someone in you know, obviously, they've, they've both taken national positions, which have a little bit to do with being governor of Florida. But when you talk about Gillum and his uh, desire, for example, to abolish uh, enforcement of immigration laws or, or impeach well, wait the a president. Second. Well, he wants to he, abolish he, ICE. He, he basically, doesn't want to say he doesn't do away with the law. Well, he, has yet, well, he doesn't want to enforce it. Uh, he certainly is against enforcing immigration law at every level. And, and, and he's moved there ideologically for purposes of getting Bernie Sanders and Tom Steyer and all these other groups in, involved in him. So there's going to be a clear ideological difference. But here's the, the core. Florida, by and large, is doing better in the country. Our unemployment rate is lower. Our economic growth rates are higher. It doesn't mean we don't have problems. We do have issues. But he offers a radically different approach, fundamentally different approach, to the direction Florida is on now. So there's a big difference between saying Florida is doing well, but there are things we can do even better, and saying Florida is completely on the wrong track, and we need to correct course and go something very different and become more like some of these states that are having fiscal crisis. And so voters are going to have that choice. Do we want to basically take take Florida off this path, despite, you know, we got to do better in our schools, we, there's a lot of things we need to deal with, but do we basically want to go from being one of the states with the healthiest economy, the fastest growth, to a state that kind of looks more like California and, and some of these other places? That's the choice voters are going to have. When all the noise is over, that's a choice they're going to have to make. The irony, of course, is that the Republicans got the exact Democrat they wanted to run against, and the Democrats got the Republican they wanted to run against. So both sides got what they wanted from that perspective. Maybe. And it's Careful what you ask for, right? Well, I mean, on both and, sides. And, and Hillary wanted to run against Trump. How did that work out? So um, I don't think, I think a lot of people who get paid to analyze politics these days get it wrong, and including, you know, pollsters last night in the Democratic primary. The, the electorate is as fluid as it's ever been. Well, why do you think Andrew Gillum won? Just I don't know. Look, I'm not an expert on Democratic yeah. politics. Uh, obviously, you know, he had an opportunity to mobilize and energize voters at the right time in the right way and the right numbers to win. And that's the truth about American politics today. You don't need money probably, to in some extent, matters less than it ever has. I mean, he certainly was not fundraising to the level of other people. You know, I can just tell you as a candidate in 2016, a million dollars of television does not go as far as it did 10 years ago. It just doesn't. Because people, the way people consume news and information has, has changed. And he understood that perhaps better than his opponents did. Ron DeSantis is an example of it. He didn't raise as much as Adam Putnam. He did some television, but a lot of it was earned media. And so uh, I think that's a, just a new dynamic in American politics. And, um, and so when you, unfortunately, in politics today, most of the consultants are TV consultants, so they all want you to spend billions of dollars if you can on television ads. Don't, don't knock TV ads. No, they matter. They don't know. <laughs> they're, they're, they're very important for well, all Well, but us. I would tell you, this very interview, a significant percentage of people that are going to watch it are going to watch it online and not on, at, a, at a fixed time on television. That doesn't mean they're not watching. They're just watching it somewhere else, and so they may miss the commercials. Um, and, and it's a challenge. It's why newspapers are struggling. How do you monetize clicks and viewership? And um, I'm sure WFR is doing great. 
great, mm -hmm. but, uh, but everybody else is struggling, you know? And, uh, and so my, my point being is that he obviously understood it, tapped into it, and it's like anything else in politics. You hit, you know, you get the right people mobilized and excited. Nothing replaces excitement in politics. It, and he had people excited about his candidacy, well, to his it's, credit. It's, again, I'm not asking you to become the Democratic soothsayer in terms of what's yeah. going on, but it seems if this race for the Democrats in Florida is a microcosm of what they're going to try to do in 2020. This is a test of whether or not you go to the more progressive side of the Democratic Party in terms of challenging Donald Trump or find somebody more moderate to try to sway voters well, from the middle. Both parties have had that challenge and continue to. But I would challenge you that politics today is a lot less about ideology and a lot more about the disconnect between the people who make our laws and the people that live underneath them. If you want to understand 2010, 2014, 2016, and I believe future elections, you have to understand that there's an enormous gap between what public policy elites, people in government, the media and academia are focused on and what everyday people care about. And they're not lined up. And so I think there's a sense across the American political spectrum that the people in office spend all their time fighting for things that don't matter in the real world. And the things that matter in the real world aren't getting enough attention. And, and so they want to send people that are going to blow it up, that are basically gonna force change in the status quo. And the more the established figures in politics attack you, the stronger it makes you in the eyes of people that wanna see something different. I think that explains Bernie Sanders, I think that explains Donald Trump. And I think that is a dangerous thing for the country because uh, Vladimir Putin is a threat to America. The v overwhelming majority of the men and women who serve us in the intelligence community and the FBI are patriotic Americans, not members of the deep state. Kids should be vaccinated. I mean, all these things, but some of these things are being questioned now because the experts saying these things are people whose motivations and intentions are questioned by millions of everyday Americans who wonder, you know, who's fighting and understands people like me. And oftentimes they feel like the people in power look down on people like them. You see journalists going out into middle America covering Trump voters the way an anthropologist would cover some lost tribe in the Amazon. Uh, these are everyday Americans. And just because they don't live in Washington or New York doesn't mean that their views aren't real and don't matter. And, and you can't attribute everything they do, everything they stand for and everyone they vote for on them being backwards or xenophobic or, or racist. And so that disconnect is real and it's playing out in both parties. The passing of John McCain has resonated throughout the country. I asked Senator Rubio what made McCain such a powerful figure. Uh, there's three things that impress me about him, incredible energy, I and mean, this guy is never tired. I, I made, I had the honor and also made the mistake of traveling with him overseas, and these trips were, his, uh, his theme was march or die. So we would start at 6 a.m. and finish at midnight. Uh, we went to Libya together, which in hindsight, I found out later we weren't supposed to be there. It was an unauthorized trip. He commandeered an airplane and on our, it was crazy because there was no government at the time we went. And uh, on our way out, we stopped at this prison where there were all of these uh, African mercenaries being held that had been hired by Gaddafi. And McCain ordered their release. And I said, no, we're gonna leave and they'll be released 45 minutes after we're out of here. Uh, but I just, you know, he was so much energy. His second is he just wasn't afraid of anything. And I think given his life experience, when he made up his mind, it was gonna, he was for it. And no political pressure, no poll, no uh, lobbying, nothing was gonna back him off. Uh, his favorite saying, and he said it time and again, it's just the right thing to do. And uh, I think it's a lesson for me and for everybody to kind of be more like that. So that, and then the third, uh, the one, in addition to sort of his moral compass and his drive and the energy that he brought to everything was, was um, his stature, you know, and it's very difficult to replicate that. No matter how, it's not just a number of years, it's his life experience. It's the fact that it's hard to debate with a guy on torture when he's been tortured. It's hard to debate with someone about the cost of war when he's paid it and his family's paid it. So he's not really replaceable, but there are lessons to be learned from his service to our country. And I disagreed with John from time to time on issues. That doesn't mean like everybody else, I didn't admire him. And, uh, and it's, it, it feels weird to be in politics without John McCain. Um, uh, politics without John McCain is, is difficult to understand because he's been such a towering figure. The, the second point that you made about how it's a matter of just your moral compass, do the right thing. Why does that stand out in Washington? Why, why does that almost seem like, like something to be credited as opposed to something to be ex expected of all? Well, it's not for the reason, it's not that people seek to do the wrong thing. It's that in public office, frankly, you depend on public approval to stay in office. It's just that that's what elections are about. And you want more people to agree with you than disagree with you. That didn't seem to matter as much to John McCain. Whether that was part of his constitution as a person or part of his life experience, 
he made up his mind about, and he wasn't always right, but if he thought it was right, it didn't matter how much political pressure came to bear, he was going to ignore it and at his own peril, right? I mean, you see the polls now where Republican numbers for him are not great. He just didn't seem affected by that the way others do. Whether that's a product of so many years in this process or just sort of his natural characteristics or, you know. But shouldn't we expect that from our leaders? I guess that's my point. Shouldn't we automatically expect them to do, to be guided by that principle as opposed to, um, sure. you know, trying to do things for more but expedient I think what, reasons? I think what stood out about about John is is not that just that he had that attribute, but his willingness to stick with it irrespective of what the uh, political consequences of it might be. And frankly, uh, uh, most people don't do it, not because they're immoral, but because you can make a big difference on nine things. You're not going to let the tenth thing knock you out of office, so you can't make a difference on the other nine. They're more pragmatic about picking and choosing your spots. John didn't pick or choose spots. Every spot he was going to fight on in every fight, and it made him unique. It didn't make him perfect. You know, he was a lot of times the things he thought he was right on, he wasn't necessarily always right on, per se, at least in my view. That doesn't mean you can't admire sort of that uniqueness of it. We'll be right back after the break. Acura Summer Performance Event in soon. So get a new 2019 TLX for $329 a month. Over At 8.30 a.m., I'm Jim DeFiti. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Other dealers may not like it, but they can.